sermon series, Wisdom and Worship, Proverbs chapter 4, looking at verse 20 through 27. Before we get into the scriptures this morning, I want to show you some images. My wife and I, a while back, took a trip to Hot Springs, Arkansas. Has anybody ever been to Hot Springs, Arkansas? We were in the area, and so we decided to hop on over to Hot Springs, Arkansas, because what was there interested me. I have some pictures I want to show you. Let me give you the first one. There's us my ugly mug, and that's my beautiful wife. You can see behind us the spring. Now, when we walked up to this spring, it was just in the middle of the city, and it was a national park, a state park, actually, I believe, and we went up, and we kind of were walking in two separate ways. She was going around one side, and I was going to the left, and and I saw her, though, out of the corner of my eye, and she, we, we had this conversation the whole time. How hot do you think it's really going to be? Is it really going to be that hot? You know, how hot could this water really be? And I, I saw her out of the corner of my eye. She reached over and, and touched the water and went like that. And I knew immediately that it was pretty hot, 143 degrees, to be precise. And uh, I was amazed by that. And it also immediately brought to my attention a specific proverb, Proverbs chapter 4, Verse 23, it says, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. We see these springs in Hot Springs, Arkansas. I want to show you just a few more pictures. There's a clearer one just of the spring. It's crystal clear. They say you can drink it. Obviously, you'll probably have to let it cool off a little bit. We go to the next one. Spanish explorers and the Indians knew about the springs, and they created these, these spas Uh, 50, 60, 70, almost 100 years ago that people could come and relax in these hot springs. I think there's one more. That's a bathtub that they created. They they, they were luxury items and they'd fill the bathtubs. The springs would be pumped in directly from the mountains. But I, I couldn't help but think about all the times the Bible talks about the heart and the springs that flow from the heart. And it was a great visual illustration for me and something that stuck in my mind in regards to the heart. What comes to your mind when you think about the heart? Some of you that maybe have had heart issues, literally, physically, might think about that. Some of you who maybe have been heartbroken think about love and think about heart, the heart in that regards. But the heart, when the Bible speaks about the heart, and specifically when the book of Proverbs speaks about the heart, it's referring to the emotions, the will, and the mind. That's important to know. I invite you to write it down if you'd like. The heart, when we're talking about the heart this morning, understand it's talking about the inner self. And the inner self consists of the mind, the emotions, and the will. Now, how do we know that? Well, we know that because we think that. You want to know what your heart is? It's what you think. In fact, that's what Proverbs says in Proverbs 23, 7. It says, for as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Your thoughts reveal your mind, of course, your will, and your emotions. So this morning, as we're talking about the heart, we'll be digging into the scriptures and discussing the heart. I want you to remember that that's what the heart is. It's the inner person, the mind, the will, and the emotions. It's who you are as a person. And scripture indicates that our hearts, though, can be polluted, and we would be wise to regularly take inventory to see if we have a polluted heart. Proverbs chapter 4, beginning in verse 20, we'll read 20 through 27, it says this. This is Solomon speaking, and he says, My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their body. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away from your mouth a deceitful mouth and put devious speech far from you. Let your eyes look directly ahead and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. Watch the path of your feet and all your ways will be established. Do not turn to the right nor to the left. Turn your foot from evil. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time together. I pray that you would speak to us. God, I pray that your word would go out and not return void. It would change us from the inside out. Pray for those here who have never trusted in Christ that they would do that today that they would understand the gospel, that I would speak it and preach it clearly, 
that they would know that salvation is in no one else other than Jesus Christ. He is the only way to God the Father, and if they simply, by faith, humble themselves and trust in your provision of your Son on the cross, that he paid the penalty, he paid the price, so that they could have eternal life. God, that they could have eternal salvation. I pray that this would be the day of their salvation. I pray for every single believer, including myself, that you would be merciful to us, that you would grant us grace and mercy and show us your word, your truth, and who you are. We'll give you the praise and the glory for it. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. I want to give you simply six spiritual inventory questions this morning. Six probing questions that you can ask yourself to understand where you are in terms of your heart. Number one is simply this. Do I have a double heart? Scripture speaks often of a double heart. In Psalm chapter 12, verse 1 through 2, it says... Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases to be, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. They speak falsehood to one another. And then he says this, with flattering lips and with a double heart they speak. What is a double heart? Well, to be very clear and very simple, a double heart is a deceitful heart. The double heart is a deceitful heart. And listen, it shows itself in a very specific way. You want to know if you have a double heart? You want to know if you have a deceitful heart? Verse 24 of the passage we're reading this morning says this. Solomon says to his son, put away from your mouth a what? A deceitful mouth, there's the double heart, and put devious speech far from you. You see, we understand that the double heart can be, can be brought to light by watching what we say. You want to know if you have a deceitful heart? Just watch your lips. Proverbs 12, 22 indicates this and says this. Lying lips are what? An abomination to the Lord, but those who deal faithfully are his delight. Proverbs 20, 19 speaks specifically of gossip. One who goes about as a slanderer reveals secrets, therefore do not associate with a gossip. I just want to take a moment because in Proverbs, what we see is a lot of disjointed information, seemingly anyways. It'll talk about adultery, it'll talk about lust, it'll talk about gossip, it'll talk about drunkenness, and it's very subject-oriented, all under the umbrella of being wise, right? Getting wisdom. That's what we said at the very beginning of this sermon series, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? To reverence God, to respect God his holiness, his righteousness, his justice, everything that God is, that's the beginning of wisdom. And it will keep you from these things. But we still need to know practically what these things are that we can get hung up on. Amen? We fight against those things by the grace of God, through the Spirit of God and the Word of God, but we need to know what we need to fight against. And one of those major things, and the church needs to hear this this morning, is gossip. Gossip seems to be one of those sins that's just like, you give a little nod and a wink. Ah, oh, it's not that big a deal, right? We just let it slide in our own lives and in the lives of others. Well, what is gossip? Matt Mitchell wrote a book, and he said in this book a very succinct definition of gossip. I like it. I want to give it to you. It's, it's this. The sin of gossip is bearing bad news behind someone's back out of a bad heart it's a lot of bees right it's really easy to remember the sin of gossip is bearing bad news behind someone's back and then he says the motive part or the intent from a bad heart that's gossip as I read that definition I thought oh no <laughs> I'm guilty of gossip and you likely are too sometimes we we do it in the guise of, you know, well, we're just concerned, or it's a prayer request. But that definition brings what gossip is really to light. I came up with my own four questions to ask myself, and I want to give them to you. Four questions to ask yourself in regards to gossip. And the first is a little bit humorous, a little bit funny. I just said, is it spicy? <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not talking about food. Proverbs 18.8 talks about it being a morsel. Do we have Proverbs 18, 8? The words of a gossiper are like dainty morsels. That means like little bites of just 
good, either spicy or sweet food. And it just tastes so good going down, and you get a little bit of a, a thrill from eating it. Anybody get a thrill from eating? Say amen. Don't let me be the only one. But, but you can relate that way to gossip, can't you? Right? Sometimes you're like, oh, man, this is, nobody else knows this, and it's just kind of tasty, right? It's, it's, a little, it's a little spicy information. Man, that should be a dead giveaway that you need to stop right there. Amen? I also ask myself, are they present? Is it spicy? Is it a little bit, you know, forbidden fruit type thing? Is it, is it a little tasty information? And secondly, are they even there? Are they present with you? If they're not there, man, there's a 50-50 chance that it might be gossip. So just ask yourself, are, is this person even present? Thirdly, what's my intent? That speaks to motivation. Why am I even sharing this? Is it out of the goodness of my heart? Is it because I care, because I have concern? Or is it because I, I, I just want to indulge a little bit and I have information no one else knows, and so I'll feel important after that? Or, or maybe you don't like the person, and so it's your chance to just give them a little stab, Right? What's my intent? 1 Corinthians 16, 4, the end of 1 Corinthians, Paul tells the Corinthians, he says, look, let all that you do be done in love. And so when you're speaking to others, you need to make sure that what you're talking about with other people, it's not always wrong to talk about somebody when they're not there. It might be a very good thing. In fact, believers ought to be talking about other believers in the church in an edifying way. Amen. And the litmus test is love. What's your intent? Are you doing it from a heart of love and listen, and also in a loving manner? And then the last one should be obvious. Is it true? You say, I don't know. That's a good indicator. Just back off. Go to the source. If you know that person, call them up. In front of the other person that's telling you about that person, be like, you know what, let's, let's text them. <laughs> That will be a good indicator of what they're doing, if it's wrong or right, right? They'll immediately be like, oh, maybe we shouldn't text them. Maybe we shouldn't call them, right? Is it true? If you don't know, you need to go to the source. Amen? Do I have a double heart? Gossip is a sure sign that you have a double heart. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19 speaks of undisciplined lips what often leads to gossip specifically in the new testament we see in the churches that the people that deal with gossip the most you know who it is it's little old ladies that's not me that's bible because they got nothing else to do and they hear things and they and back then they didn't pick up the phone they just went to each other and bop, 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 bop. and then the church foyer blah 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 did you hear blah 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 church we need to guard against that amen It comes from undisciplined lips. Proverbs 10, 19, when there are many words, there's a red flag. Transgression is unavoidable. But he who restrains his lips is wise. You need to have control over your mouth. Not just in what you say, but in how often you say things. Matthew chapter 12, verse 34 through 37, Jesus says, to the religious leaders, you brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his own good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an account for it in the day of judgment. Verse 37, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. How in the world can Jesus say this when we know it's an issue of the heart? It's because the mouth reflects the heart. Watch your lips, and you'll see if you have a deceitful heart. If you want to know what's in your heart, pay attention to what exits your lips. Do I have a double heart? Secondly, do I have a hard heart? Do I have a hard heart? What is a hard heart? Well, Proverbs Chapter 28, verse 14. Did I put that one on the screen? No? There it is. 
Happy is the one who is always reverent. I know we're going to be going through all these slides really quickly this morning, right? Because there's a lot of them. But I want you to see the scriptures as well as hear, hear them. Happy is the one who is always reverent, but one who hardens his heart falls into trouble. A hard heart is the inability. Here's the definition of a hard heart if you want to write it down. A hard heart is the inability to see, understand, hear, and remember. Listen, here's the important part. God in his goodness. A hard heart is the inability to see, understand, hear, and remember God and his goodness, specifically to me and to you. You will develop a hard heart if you don't intentionally remember God's goodness to you. This happened to the disciples. In the book of Mark, chapter 8, verse 17 through 19, aware of this, it says, He said to them, Why are you discussing that you do not have any bread? Jesus is speaking to the disciples. He says this, Don't you understand or comprehend? Is your heart, what? Hardened? Do you have eyes and not see? Do you have ears and not hear? And do you not remember? Of course they have eyes. Of course they have ears. They've heard Jesus say all the things he said. They've seen Jesus do all the things he's done. What is he saying? He's speaking rhetorically. He's speaking metaphorically. He's saying, look, I know you know these things intellectually, but you're not remembering them from the heart. You don't remember what I have done for you. Verse 19, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, this wasn't long ago, folks. He says, how many baskets full of pieces of bread did you collect? See, when we forget what God has done for us, our hearts begin to harden. You might hear it this way. We talked about gossip coming out of your mouth. That's a sign of a deceitful or a double heart. If you want to know if you have a hard heart, it sounds like this. God doesn't doesn't care. I mean, if, if he cared, why would I be going through this? Listen, that is the beginning of... The potential beginning of a hardened heart. God must be punishing me. Nothing ever seems to work out. No matter how hard I work, no matter how good I try to be, no matter how much I try to please God, he, he just must not care. He must hate me. Something's not right. My life is a wreck. My, my, my decisions, I mean, everything's just going downhill. And it's just, listen, a lot of it is just this. It's a backdrop of, listen, negativity. Negativity, negativity, negativity. Listen, the Christian has the, 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 the least amount of reasons to be negative. Amen? Amen? It all begins, this woe is me mentality, this victimhood mentality. You should never be a victim. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are not a victim. In fact, the Bible calls you a conqueror, more than a conqueror. Amen? Amen? But it begins, I'm not saying that it always is this aspect in the moment, that, but it begins with, with just forgetting what God has done for us. How quickly we forget his provision and his goodness. And in Isaiah, he calls the, the people of Israel, he says, remember the former things, those of long ago. Maybe you need to keep a journal or a diary. You need to keep a record of what God has done. If nothing else, put a cross up everywhere. That'll help you. Amen. The gospel tells you that he does love you, he is for you, he has saved you. You have a home in heaven, you have eternity with him. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. You are a conqueror in Jesus Christ. You are a formidable force, not because of who you are, but because of the spirit of God within you. And nothing formed against you will prosper, amen? Amen. But that takes intention. That that takes diligence. That takes rewiring your mind. Not being controlled by your emotions, remembering the former things will keep you from having a hard heart. But what ultimately causes a hard heart? Well, one of the things is we forget so quickly. But another thing we know about and we talk about all the time at this church is unrepentant sin. Unrepentant sin will always lead to a hard heart. It doesn't happen all at once. It's like the Bible says it's like an iron. When I was in college, I did the stupidest thing. I've ever done in my life. Well, maybe not the stupidest, but one of the dumbest things I've ever done. I let somebody basically brand me. (laughs) And I was a big tough guy, right? And I let them brand me, and I called my mom the next day, and I'm like, hey, mom, I I accidentally, I I lied. Uh, This is, we're going to have to cut this out of the video so my mom doesn't (laughs) see this. 
I said, Mom, I, I accidentally burned myself with an iron. What do I do? She's like, put some aloe on it. I'm like, all right. So she helped me. But I had this brand, and, and, and to this day, it's still there. It's the stupidest, one of the stupidest things I've ever done. But I, I, it made me, even today, it makes me think about when you brand an animal, when you brand a cow. If you do it over and over the first time, it's terrible, right? But it eventually builds up what? Scar tissue. And pretty soon, it's desensitized and loses its feeling. Listen, that's what sin does to your soul as a Christian. The more you continue to sin, the, the more you're desensitized to that sin, the more you can sin without remorse or regret. And before you know it, your heart becomes calloused. It becomes hardened. We can quench the spirit when we continue in our sin. And we can develop a hard heart. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1-2, through 2, Paul is speaking to the young pastor Timothy. He says, but the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. By means, now watch this, by means of the hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. There's what we just talked about. But who is he talking about? He's not talking about just average Christians in the church. He's talking about Teachers, by means of hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. People are going to be deceived in the last days by people who stand behind a pulpit and they preach falsities and they preach errant doctrine and it sounds good and it's 99% truth with just that 1% of a lie that will throw you off course as a Christian and if you're not a believer, it will damn you to hell. It is a serious, serious issue you say how can these people and they seem like good people they seem like they want to do the will of God I've listened to them myself and most of their messages are great but then you hear that one thing that they say and you're like whoa (laughs) that's not gospel that's not biblical you say how can they teach that how can they go there they do it because their conscience has been seared they don't even know it's wrong anymore they genuinely believe it in their heart of hearts that doesn't give them the excuse And God will not pardon them for that false teaching. But you and I, as we listen to those folks, we need to have minds that are understanding of a biblical mindset. We need to filter everything through the word of God. And we need to guard our own hearts, lest someone else whose heart has been seared leads our hearts into being hardened as well. Amen? Amen. Do I have a hard heart? If we habitually continue to engage in sin... There will come a time when God will give us over to our, quote-unquote, debased mind. And he will let you have your way. Romans chapter 1 speaks to this in terms of the population, in terms of the rest of the world. You want to know what's going on in our country? Read Romans 1. God is giving them over. It's part of the punishment. He says, okay, you want to think this crazy about something? You want to act like this isn't sin? You want to put yourself against me? and you are unrepentant, and you're continuing in your sin, he says, okay, have it your way. Unrepentant sin can lead to a hard heart, but also, secondly, unhealed scars can lead to a hardened heart. Harbored bitterness toward others and even towards God causes a hard heart. Harbored bitterness toward others and toward God causes a hard heart. Maybe you're still holding a grudge with somebody in your family. It's inevitable that your heart will become hardened. You continue in that mindset. You continue down that path. It will continue to harden your heart. Ephesians 4, 31 through 32, Paul says, let all, what? Bitterness. How many of you have ever been bitter? Huh. How many of you were bitter this last week? Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Paul says, listen, Ephesians, listen, Christians, you forgive if they take the steps that you want them to take. Amen? If they're truly repentant, right? No, no, he says, you forgive You let go of bitterness and wrath and anger and all these things. Why? Just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Through grace. Through grace. 
but we hold on to bitterness and we have unhealed scars from people who have hurt us in the past and it causes, listen, it's not just damaging your relationship with them, it's damaging your relationship with God. And it's damaging your relationship with people who aren't even involved. Are you listening? Hebrews 12, 15, make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God. He says, don't get away from the grace of God. The grace of God is, is what actually helps you love people that are unlovable, right? He says in that no root of bitterness. Now, mind you, he says root. He wants you to get it before it starts growing. Amen? Springs up, and then he says this, causing trouble, and by it, listen, defiling many. It's a cancer in your family. It's a cancer in your church. It's a cancer in the people that you love that hang around you. You have to hit it where it is. Get it at the root. Nip it in the bud, so to speak. You have to eliminate that bitterness. And if you don't, your heart will just harden and harden and harden. And you've seen bitter old people that just can't let it go, right? And they hate everybody. You know, nine times out of ten, the person that cuts you off, the person that cusses you out, the person that is mean to you for no reason in public, you know what's really happening? They have bitterness and hatred and hurt in their heart, and a Christian ought not be like that. We know the grace of God. We know the God of all grace. Amen? See, the fact of the matter is this. Life is hard. It's filled with pain and suffering, and no one escapes it. People hurt, and you've heard this, people who are hurt, hurt people. So you should expect it, but then remember Solomon's words when he says, watch over your hearts. Pay attention to it. Don't let it get to that hardened state. Otherwise, we will begin to blame others. And listen, here's the worst of it. We will begin to blame God. Thirdly, do I have a prideful heart? Do I have a prideful heart? Proverbs 21.4. Haughty eyes and a proud heart, the lamp of the wicked is sin. This is what leads the proud in heart. It, it's, it's, it's their own ego. It's their own understanding. It's their own view of themselves. Haughty eyes and a proud heart, the lamp of the wicked is sin. I came across a video on Instagram, and I think we have, do we have that? Okay. Can we show that at this time? I just want you to watch this. It's like 30-something seconds. I want you to see this. <clears throat> if you have to restart. Heaven right now and stood in front of me and proved to me that he exists. Just because I want you to catch the very first thing that she says. If the biblical God came down from heaven right now and stood in front of me and proved to me that he exists, I still would not worship him. Let's suppose Christianity was true. Would you follow Jesus? Not just acknowledge his existence. Would you follow him? Would you yield your life to Christ? Follow Christ. Worship God. And if their answer is no, then I say evidence isn't your problem. Because even if it was true, you still wouldn't, you wouldn't come in line. You wouldn't yield your heart and life to Christ. That's a different issue. From my personal experience, more people are turning their back on God because of heart issues than evidence issues. That's our society, folks. That's the attitude. That's the mindset of a prideful heart. Even if the biblical God, she says, comes down, stands before me, and proves he exists, I still would not worship him. That's pride. That's all. That's just straight unadulterated pride in the human heart. And listen, every one of us is capable of it. Because in our hearts, in our nature, that's what we want to do. You say, I could never do that. Did you sin yesterday? Did you sin today? Because what you did when you sinned is said, I know better than God. I am not, I'm not going to worship God. I'm going to worship myself. You see, behind every sin is pride. John 3, 19 through 20, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. You see, you have to understand why people don't come to Christ. Why? Listen to me. Are you listening? Say amen. amen. You want to know why your son or daughter, your uncle, your aunt, your mom, your dad, your nephew, your niece, your grandchildren, you know why they're walking away from the church and the gospel? 
all it is. It's probably not really so much what you did or didn't do. If you raised them in the church, if you talked about Christ, if you told them the gospel, you know what it is? It's their pride. How many of you like going floating or tubing? Come on. The hooch, right? Chattahoochee, you get in a tube, you float down it. Jillian's like, no thank you. <laughs> I used to love that when I was in college. And I still love going on a hot day and sitting on the river. Imagine you're going tubing and you're floating down that river and it's beautiful and it's, it's cool and the, 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 the water is just a perfect temperature and you're just having a great time, right? You have a nice ice cold Coca-Cola, amen? <laughs> I'm watching you. <laughs> you're floating down the river and somebody says from the shore, hey, 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 get out, get out now. You need to get out. There's, there's been a, an accident, and, and it's dropped off. It's like 50 feet. If you go down there, there's rocks down there, and you're gonna, you might die. You might seriously get hurt. And the person's, they're having such a good time, they just ignore it. That's a, that's a perfect illustration of what happens in the heart of a person that is prideful. In their, they, they love their sin. They don't want to come to Christ because Christ is the light and he will shine on them and show them their sinfulness and their wretchedness and their wickedness and they will then have to humble themselves and ask for forgiveness and they will no longer be God. You see, the human heart is wicked and desperately, it's desperately wicked, the Bible says, and who can know it? Proverbs 6, 16 through 17 says this, there are six things which the Lord hates, yet seven which are an abomination to him. And there's the first one, haughty eyes, that's pride. It's a rejection of God and his authority. Proverbs 16, 15, the next verse says this. Do we have six, the next one? 16, 5, I'm sorry. Everyone who is proud in their heart is an abomination to the Lord, assuredly he will not be unpunished. You see, God hates pride because pride is a direct attack on his sovereignty and his supremacy. He hates it. He has to hate it. Some people are like, I don't understand why God has to be so mean. <laughs> why can't he just let us be us, right? Let me be me. You see, what you have to understand is that pride is rebellion against God himself. Someone once said pride is practical atheism. Psalm 10.4 is not on the screen. It says this, the wicked in the haughtiness of his countenance does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. It's not just somebody saying that and mentally acknowledging that. They live like that. God hates pride because pride is the exaltation of self over God. Now listen to me. Here's where it gets, it gets a little bit deep. I just want you to track with me. Is God good? According to scripture, is God good? He is. Amen? And so he will not do and cannot do anything outside of that goodness. And so when he tells us to submit to him and to worship him and to obey him and to come to him for salvation and to acknowledge him as God and to, to humble ourselves and exalt him, is that egotistical of God? No, if he's God, that makes perfect sense, right? He is the perfect being, the all-creator, the, the all-powerful, omnipotent, right? He is he's God. So, so it's not a mental, it's not, a, it's not an intellectual problem that people have. It's a heart problem that people have. And God hates it because he hates pride because it's not, what's, it's, not, it's not best for you. It's what's worst for you. Amen? R.C. Sproul said about pride, he said this. He said it's cosmic treason. But God hates pride not just because it's against him and against his sovereignty and his authority and who he is as the God of all things, of the, as the God of all universe. He also hates pride because it leads to death. It leads to death. Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. You need to ask yourself this morning, do I have a prideful heart? Now here's where it gets really scary. Number four is this, do I have a cold heart? Do I have a cold heart? Matthew chapter 24, I'm going to turn there. If you can't get there in time, that's okay. If you'd like to turn there, that's fine as well. Matthew chapter 24, I want to give you some quick context. Well, actually, we'll see the context in the passage, verse 3 through 13. Matthew 24, verse 3, it says, as he, was, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, of course, this is Christ, he says, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things happen and what will this be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? 
What are they talking about? They're talking about the end times, right? They're talking about the sign of the end of the age, when Christ will return. Verse 4, And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and I will, and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but that is not the end. Verse 7, For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Then they will deliver you to tribulation, and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. What's he talking about? He's talking about, the, you'll know it's the end when there's wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, natural disasters, and then he talks about persecution, but have you ever noticed this? Are you with me this morning? Say amen. amen. Verse 10. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Verse 11, many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Verse 12, because lawlessness, man, that's a term that could describe our society, amen. amen. Lawlessness is increased, and then he says this, most people's love will grow cold. Most people's love will grow cold. What is he saying? He's not talking about people out there in the world. Listen, he's talking about people in the church. He says their heart will grow cold. The cold-hearted are revealed as lawlessness increases because as lawlessness increases, persecution increases. And in order to avoid persecution, in order to avoid suffering and mockery and being made fun of, those who once had warm hearts towards Christ, those, those who once had warm hearts towards the church, those who once always came to church, loved the church, served the church, now their hearts are growing cold towards Christ and towards the church. That's what he's talking about. That's what we see in our day and age, folks. COVID was a great excuse for some people to leave the church. Look, I'm not saying that people didn't have real reason to stay home for COVID. I'm not saying that older people with, with problems and that they watched online and those types of things. I'm, I'm, I'm saying this. Take a closer look at your heart when it's hard to come to church. When, when persecution increases... Does it stir your heart to serve Christ more, or does it make you want to shy away? I don't want any of that. <laughs> he says this is what's going to happen in the last times. True Christian love cannot grow cold because it is put on fire and kept on fire by Christ himself. By the spirit of the living God within you. The true believer and follower of Christ loves Christ and his church through any and all trials. Philippians 1.6 is on the screen. It says this, For I am con confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. God will perform what he said he will perform. He will keep you through the storm. He will keep you through the trial. In fact, you want to know, if some of you out there are saying, I don't know if I'm really a Christian or not. When a trial comes up, what do you do? That's a good way to find out if your faith is real. That's what Peter says. It has to be tested like gold, like silver, and it will come out refined. It will come out pure. Your faith will be increased through a trial if you're a believer. If you're not, that's where we see people walk away from the church and from Christ. The spirit within the believer will not allow genuine believers to fall away or to fail. 2 Corinthians 13.5 Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, indeed, you fail to meet the test. Whereas on the opposite end of the spectrum, the love of false professing Christians will grow cold. The true believer's love for Christ and his church will actually intensify under persecution. Nothing will stop you from Christ and his church. You say, is it my resolve? Is it my dedication, my commitment? No, it's Christ in you. The spirit of the living God will not allow you to fall. Amen. Philippians 1, 9 through 10, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more. Paul prays for the Philippians. He says he wants their love to increase. If under pressure, under trial, under persecution, under suffering, if your faith decreases and if you ultimately walk away from the faith, I'm not talking about just a lapse in judgment. Every one of us fall. Every one of us have hard seasons in life. Amen? 
Every one of us questions sometimes. That's just human nature. I'm talking about you say enough. I'm not doing that anymore. It's not worth my time. My heart's not there. And I'm not going to suffer the persecution that comes along with it. You have a cold heart. And in fact, it's our next point. It's our unbelieving heart. That's the question we need to ask ourselves. Do I have an unbelieving heart? So many so-called Christians are deceived because they, listen, they grew up in a church, they said a prayer, their parents are believers. Can I just say this? As a pastor, man, I, I, I'm not, you can tell I'm frustrated because what I see in the Christian church is people who allow their children and their grandchildren to grow up in the church to say a prayer and to hang everything on that prayer. Huh. And there's no fruit. There's no desire for the church. Listen, just face up to it. Your kid's not saved. They're not a believer. So what? They said a prayer. They don't love the church. They don't love Christ. They don't care about spiritual things. What good is it doing you to deny that? Step up to the plate. Confront it head on. Tell your child, your grandchild, your nephew, your niece, your friend, your loved one, look, I'm concerned. This is not, they're, immediately it's going to, it's going to be, you're judging me. If that comes to, the, to light, you know what you can pretty much write down? That person is not a believer. Because the true believer will be like, maybe if my life's not matching up to what the word of God says, maybe that is me. There will be, listen to me, there will be humility. Paul tells them, test yourselves. It's not a bad thing to question. Amen. Stop, let's stop being cowards. I care too much about my family members. I don't give, I don't give, a, I don't care. I don't care what they think about me. All I care about is if they know Christ. Genuinely, truly, you can call me every name in the book. If it means your eternal salvation, I'll be the bad guy. Just check yourself. See if you're in the faith. This is the attitude we must have as believers in Christ. To be willing to be run over. To be willing to be maligned and made fun of and blamed. No, just see if you're in the faith. Do you do the things Christ said do? Do you know Christ? Do you love Christ? Do you love the church? Do you love the word of God? Not perfectly, but is there a desire in your heart to grow in Jesus, to live for him, to bring glory to his name? Listen, it's not about a church. It's not about a book. It's about Jesus Christ. And if a person isn't about Jesus Christ, you have every right and they have every right to say, am I truly a follower? Because the person that knows Jesus Christ intimately, understanding what he did for them on the cross, there is no gift greater than salvation. There is no gift greater, listen, 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 than God himself giving himself to us. It doesn't make sense any other way. It doesn't make sense for a person to live opposite of what Christ said. And then to claim, oh, I know Christ. No. That's not what Christ said. Do I have an unbelieving heart? Hebrews 3.12, take care, brothers and sisters, that there will not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Now, many people look at this verse and they say, see, you can lose your salvation. That's not what this verse is saying. What is it saying? This, these people that the author of Hebrews is talking about, he's, he's talking about people, listen to me, this is, oh my gosh, this is the difference between heaven and hell, folks. These are people who knew the gospel. And not just that they knew it, they heard it, they heard it preached, they heard it taught, and they probably even, listen, they agreed and they believed with their heads, but they never came to Christ. They never submitted their lives to Jesus Christ. He was just a get out of hell free card. He was Savior, but he was never Lord. And you don't make Jesus Christ your Lord. I've heard preacher after preacher say this, and I couldn't agree more. You don't make Jesus Lord. He is Lord. All you do is fall to your feet and acknowledge he's Lord. He's God, I'm not. God, I need a Savior. And you crawl, and you beg in your heart of heart, and your mind, and you plead with God, save me a sinner. That's the attitude of a believer. That's the attitude of a genuine heart that's been transformed. These people were so close. 
They were so close, they probably sat in church week after week after week, and they thought their good works would get them to heaven. And Christ will say to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Do you know Christ? Is it a personal relationship of trust and faith in him? Or do you have an unbelieving heart? The author of Hebrews is saying that those who have heard the gospel message, understood it as truth, and yet never actually in humility trusted in Christ as Savior and Lord, they will fall away from the living God. That is, they lose eternal life forever. Lastly, and here's the answer to it all, do you have a new heart? That's the only heart that has a relationship with God. That's the only heart that gets into heaven. That's the only heart that is forgiven. It's a new heart. In Ezekiel 36, 26, a very familiar passage that no doubt you know, it's speaking of the nation of Israel. It's speaking of the Jewish people. God made specific promises to the Israelite, to, to the Jewish people. And in this verse, he says, I will give you a new heart. He's speaking to the nation as a whole. And put a new spirit in you. I will remove from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Now, now that's to the nation of Israel, but it's just as much true for every single person who puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He replaces your old fleshly heart. He replaces your old stony heart. And he gives you a genuine heart. A heart that can receive God. Because our fleshly hearts cannot receive God. <clears throat> How is this done? Second Corinthians, Paul tells us, 5.21. He, that is God, made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, I know I've preached that, that passage so much. You know it probably by heart by now. You probably have it memorized just from how many times I've quoted it here. He made him, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. But you ever notice in that verse what's happening? It's a transaction. Right? All our sin, God took and put on Christ. But it doesn't stop there. All his righteousness, God took and put on us. By faith. Not that we did anything. What's happening there? What's happening there is a heart change. God treats Jesus Christ as if he has a bad heart, an ungodly heart, a sinful heart. He never sinned, don't misunderstand me, but he was treated as if he did. He was treated as if we were him. And in, in that place, we get the heart, oh my gosh, we get the heart of Jesus Christ. That's why, that's why he says we have the mind of Christ. Remember the connection? Our heart is our will, our emotions, our mind, our thoughts. We can think like Christ as Christians because he's replaced our fleshly heart and given us the heart of our Savior. You want to talk about really giving your heart for someone? <laughs> Can I do that? Amen. <laughs> Guys, we're off the hook. Whew. Man, what, a, what? It's just, it's unfathomable what Christ has done for us. And he offers it to every single person. What happened on the cross was a heart transplant for all those who by faith will trust in Jesus Christ. You receive the new heart by humbly admitting that you need a new heart. And acknowledging God has provided that new heart for you through faith. In Jesus Christ alone. Here's the application as we close. Three simple points. Number one, repent from sin. This is applicable to believers and unbelievers alike. It's just in different ways. If you're an unbeliever, you have to repent. That is, you have to have a change of mind about who you are and who God is. You have to see yourself as a wretched, sinful person who cannot earn the favor of God. And who is justly condemned because God is righteous and holy and just. And you have to say, I humble myself and I come at the mercy of God and the grace of God and I trust in Jesus Christ. That's what repentance looks like for an unbeliever. For the believer, it looks like... 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the pattern of the true believer. You never, ever, ever stop repenting. Not for salvation, but for sanctification. 
And it is a joy to repent. And you don't feel beat up when you repent. And you don't get tired anymore because you know no matter what you do, you're a child of God. And if you come to him in humility, he will, because you are his child through Jesus Christ, his son, he will, he will, he will forgive you no matter what your feelings say, no matter what the world says, no matter what the enemy says. He will forgive you because he's faithful to his word, because of his character, not because of yours. And you bank your life and you bank what you do on that. Not on what you feel, not on what you think, but on what Christ has said. Proverbs 28, 13. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Psalm 51, 7. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God, you will not despise. You will not reject God will never turn away someone who is truly humble and knows they need forgiveness in Christ. Repent from your sin. Secondly, refocus on Jesus Christ. Verse 24 shows us that repentance. Put away. He says, stop. That's what repentance is, right? It's a change of mind that leads to a change of action. You say, how do I know if I'm truly repentant? What are you doing? Not what are you saying. Not what did you pray. What are you doing, right? It starts with a conversation with the Lord, but then you follow it up with action. He says, put away from your mouth deceitful, put away from you a deceitful mouth and put devious speech far from you. There's the repentance, it's action. But then in verse 25, he says, let your eyes look directly ahead and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. What's he talking about? For the believer, what does that mean? We just look off into the distance like, okay, I hope there's something out there I can just fix my eyes on. No, it's on Christ. Hebrews tells us that, right? Fixing our eyes on the pastor. Please don't do that. I will disappoint every time. Fixing your eyes on your spouse. Fixing your eyes on the church. No, fixing your eyes on Jesus. Amen? He's the author and perfecter of our faith. Can I see that verse? Fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What is that, church? Listen, that's the gospel. This is how you, listen, oh, please hear me. This is how you keep your heart soft. Some of you have been coming to church so long, and you come up to me after service, and you just want to tell me something. And that's okay. But, but I wonder, I often wonder, if somebody always just comes up and tells me something and never says, man, the word of God spoke to me, pastor. My heart is broken, pastor. What you said was true, pastor. It's nothing of you. You know what that makes me think? Their heart has grown cold, calloused. Their eyes aren't on Jesus. They're on themselves. We focus on the gospel. We focus on Christ. And our hearts will remain tender and moldable and pliable and ready to receive the word of God, which is number three. Recenter on the word. Verse 20 and 21, the very first part that we read, Solomon says, My son, give attention to my words. His words here are representative of the word of God. He redirects his son to the word, always going back to the word, always keeping it. Listen, watch this. Are you with me? Say amen. I'm almost done, I promise. He says, do not, do not let them, the words of God, don't let them depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart, in the center of your heart. Keep the word of God central in your life. Have more intake of the word of God than everything else. And what will happen? He says, verse 22, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their body. <laughs> you want a healthy life, a life that's like a spring constantly pouring forth joy and love and peace in, in all the things that we find in Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. You have to focus on the gospel, focus on Christ, and then constantly, constantly feed that with what? With the word of God, because that's the only way we know Jesus Christ. It's through the word of God, amen? And it's come full circle just like that spring. That spring in Arkansas, you know what that water's from? It's from rain. Four, five, six thousand years ago, rain came down, settled through these porous rocks, 
went to the bottom. It's getting heated by the core of the earth. And then it comes back up through these fissures in the ground, through these cracks and crevices in the ground, and the cycle repeats itself. Listen, that is the picture of the Christian life. At your core, the only way you stay hot, the only way you stay on fire, the only way you have intensity is to keep your focus on Christ and his gospel, and it's found in the word of God. Amen? Amen. The heart is a spring that can only be purified by keeping that which is pure as, as its source. The word of God purifies the heart and brings life and health to the entire body. Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. I believe the unexamined heart always leads and ends in death. For the Christian, not eternal death, but spiritual death here. And God will even remove you from this world. For the unbeliever, it's eternal death. See, the Lord is weighing our hearts. He's examining our hearts, and we ought to do the same. Because life is too short and eternity is too long to fail to examine our hearts. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for this time in your word. Help us not to be calloused.